All right. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction. I hope I don't disappoint. You know, when, when Rami was sharing his thoughts this morning around digital cohesion, something uh, came to mind about, about my childhood. Uh, when I was thinking about actually being very young and, and helping my dad build a Heathkit computer, some of you may remember Heathkit, and how you could then be able to play games, and I could pretty much draw a line directly from that event to where I am today. And I think about where my kids are now and being able to participate and manipulate a digitally cohesive world. And I, I just I have to think that they're getting the better end of the deal with all of the things that they're going to have access to. And they'll be able to have augmented reality and, and participate in a learning experience that was very difficult with a black and white monitor. So, I lead the Juniper Development and Innovation Organization. It is an honor to lead a passionate group of talented engineers who spend their days and nights and weekends building technology innovations around routing, switching, and security. They apply those technologies to our software, our silicon, and our systems, and pull all those things together to make sure that we're able to address the biggest challenges in our customers' networks having to do with core and edge, access and aggregation, data center, campus and branch, all of these various different places. So what I want to share with you today is a bit about innovation and the messiness around how do you go through that innovation process and I want to relate it not only to our industry, but an industry that I think many of us have been following, specifically the electric vehicle industry, and then tie that back into some of the innovations that are happening that are fundamentally critical to all of our lives. And when Rami talked about the different barriers to being able to get a digitally cohesive world, we talked about performance, we talked about security, we talked about interoperability, and all of those different barriers I'm going to share with you and get another level of detail on how they're actually impacting our lives today and into the future. Now, innovation is a, is a messy, messy game. And there's a few things that are fundamentally required. And the first of all is the seed of everything is that idea. And some people who come up with those ideas can be called visionary. Sometimes those people are called crazy people. But fundamentally, these are people who see an alternate potential future world, a world that isn't on a direct continuum from where we are today, but one that is slightly shifted because of the impact of their vision. But a vision isn't, isn't enough, because there are a lot of people that are going to say, your idea isn't the right one. It's not the right time. It's not possible for you to be able to create that alternate world. So you need to have the belief and the fortitude that what you want to achieve is possible and you will do whatever it takes to make it happen. The next thing that's critically important, of course, is funding. We can't go anywhere without money. Now, it costs a lot less today than just a few years ago or a decade ago to take an idea on. Now, whether you self-fund, you go and get a VC, you do friends and family, or you work at a company that's willing to fund your idea, idea, funding is critically important. This next one, I don't think people really pay as much attention to. You need to understand what your strengths are, and you need to understand what the strengths of the business that you're in, and how you can apply those strengths to be able to go and take your idea and make it real. But you also, need to understand whether you have the right culture to enable that and how you can modify your culture. Now, for those of you who know, especially if you read you know, things like Harvard Business Review, you know that some people say you can't change the culture. What you need is an idea and a project to actually change the culture inside of a company. You can't just go and say, let's change the culture. And I fundamentally believe in that. Now, if we take this element of innovation and we apply it to a specific industry, specifically, the electric vehicle industry. I want to talk about a company that is transforming the world. 
They have a vision for what the future looks like in the electric vehicle space, where we're less dependent on fossil fuels. They have experienced significant setbacks. Sometimes the technology doesn't always work the way that you want it to. This company has had to go to the US government and actually get funding to turn their idea into reality. This company understands fundamentally, though, what its strengths are and is able to capitalize them and has the culture to be able to go and take these things and make it happen. Now, I'm sure many of you have one company in mind, and that would be Tesla. Now, that would be the easy choice. They certainly have done more for the automobile industry and the automotive industry in the last decade than I would say almost any other company in the last 50 plus years to truly transform it. That would be the glamorous company to choose. But I want to talk about a company that's a little bit more of an underdog because everybody likes the come from behind story. We all appreciate stories like Rocky Balboa or actually giving you another idea of attempting to date myself. From the 70s, there was a movie called Breaking Away. You might remember that. And so the company I want to talk to you about is actually General Motors. Now, General Motors, if you go back to less than a decade ago, it was unclear whether they were going to survive. They had significant quality problems. If you were to go and look at the number one documentary in 2006, Who Killed the Electric Car? Many of those fingers were pointed at the executives in the traditional car industry. However, the US government pumped $50 billion worth of investment into General Motors. And one of the reasons given was because they had an electric vehicle program. So even though they had been accused of killing the electric vehicle, not once, but twice, they were believed to have what was necessary to continue on and potentially transform the industry. And what they've announced that they're going to ship later this year is the industry's first pluggable car that is available to the mass market in the $30,000 range that can go over 200 miles in a single charge. And they're able to do that one year ahead of what Tesla is currently projecting. Now, how did this company come from behind to achieve something that Tesla has been moving towards for quite some time? Well, they understood fundamentally what their strengths were, their strengths of supply chain management, their strengths in being able to mass produce vehicles. They understood who they were, and they actually were willing to make a pretty bold step in building a hybrid and then building an electric car when, quite frankly, many people across the entire globe had discounted them as a company altogether. Now, why am I talking about electric vehicles? We're at Nextworks. There's a really awesome NASCAR car behind all of you here. But I want to share with you and relate that back to where we are in the networking industry. Now, when you think about Juniper and you think about routing and switching, we're a bit more like Tesla. We actually hit our 20-year anniversary in February of this year, and we have been innovating, challenging the status quo, and always coming out with market-leading products in the routing space for 20 years, in the switching space for eight years. Now, not every single innovation was broadly accepted by the market, but that's what happens sometimes when you're constantly pushing the status quo. Not everything that you do works perfectly and hits the spot. But if you listen to what customers' problems are very carefully, you're able to go and continue to reinvent yourself and continue to push the status quo because you can't back off. Now, we've been able to do that with our MX, our PTX, and our QFX, which by almost any measurable dimension, we are significantly better than the competition. And that is in the area of performance, which is one of the barriers that Rami was discussing. Now, if you look in the area of automation, 
We have transformed how you can go and deploy services to branches and enterprise with our cloud CPE solution, which uses Contrail service orchestration. We also have given great visibility to those core infrastructures at multiple layers, whether it be IP or optical, with our North Star WAN controller. I kind of think of it as taking a view of the world like Waze does for getting you from point A to point B, the North Star WAN controller does for packets getting from point A to point B. And then in the area of openness, we have continued to push the envelope with our open contrail solution. So if you have a data center and you're deploying an OpenStack solution, OpenStack users have voted us three times now the number one deployed OpenStack network controller. That's powerful. This isn't us. This is the users actually voting us at every OpenStack summit. And then, of course, we were the first to disaggregate our OS, our carrier class Juno software. So in each of those different dimensions, we continue to lead. However, in the area of security, you could say we're a bit more like General Motors. A couple of years ago, Rami actually asked me to lead the security business in addition to leading the switching business. And it had been several years since I had been really in depth into the security business. So I went and took my time, dove in, met the team, talked to customers, talked to partners understood what we had, and what I found was probably very obvious to all of you a couple of years ago, we really hadn't been meeting our customers' requirements. We certainly weren't meeting our own expectations. But when I talked to the people, what I realized that we had two critically important things that most people outside couldn't see. One, we had a set of passionate people, passionate about the security problem that was being faced in the industry and a deep passion to want to help solve that problem. Two, we actually have fundamentally great building blocks of technology. And so what we did at that point was we agreed upon what the future strategy was going to be. We realized that simply depending upon big, fast firewalls was not enough. The transition from standard firewalls to next-gen firewalls. We were behind, but we knew we could catch up. But we also knew that the market was going to be moving. The market was moving to things that were going to be software-driven. The market was moving to cloud-focused view of the world. And as my Canadian friends like to say, you want to make sure you're skating to where the puck is going and not chasing the puck all over the ice. And so we did a two-pronged approach. One is we made sure that we had great products around the next-gen firewall space. But we also wanted to make sure that we were actually were able to paint a vision of how you could have a comprehensive, secure infrastructure. So we started down that mission two years ago. And over the last 15 months, we have unleashed an entirely new portfolio of products. And that vision, which you heard earlier, is called Software-Defined Secure Networks. And we truly believe but the future of security is about software-defined secure networks. Now, that's a pretty bold statement. So let me tell you a bit about why I believe SDSN is the future of security. Now, fundamentally, if you look at the transitions that are happening, one, we need to move from a hardware-defined error, where simply putting in more physical devices needs to be substituted for an era where we're looking at how to solve problems with software and cloud-based technologies. We need to be able to move from a perimeter-based security where you have a hard outer shell and everything in the middle is mushy and unprotected to one where you have pervasive security and every element inside of the infrastructure participates in the enforcement of policy. You want to go from a response that is very manually focused, where human beings are involved in making a decision on when to actually go and deploy the remediation for threats, to one that is automated, if you know for a fact that that threat exists. We want to go from a world where things are CLI or network management driven, to where I can simply understand what the intent is 
and understand what the policy is and able to push that throughout the infrastructure. And then one of the final barriers that Rami talked about is one of openness and interoperability. Where today I continue to stack security devices on top of security devices, and I might feel like I'm more secure, but in essence, I'm less secure because all of these devices are transmitting more and more data, which requires more humans to analyze, which requires us to actually, which actually slows down the response time. This is the problem statement as well as the direction for what the future of SDSN has to offer. Let me take it down one more level for all of you. Because we know that security is all about detection and all about enforcement. In fact, there was a company that put out a report, they do this every year, and this year they put out a report talking about in 2015 that over $3 billion was spent on almost 300 companies around the area of security. And so when I hear from other companies that you only need to trust one company to solve your security problems, I fundamentally think that perhaps they don't really understand the problem in front of them. And what's really truly required is an open approach to detection. In addition to that, you need to make sure that you're leveraging the cloud-based technologies. When we had the panel up here earlier and we're talking about big data and machine learning, you have a need to be able to apply those technologies to one of the biggest problems that we're facing today, which is security threats. So this is what I call multi-vendor detection. But that's not enough as well. You need to be able to have multi-vendor detection, but you need to be able to then go and enforce policy throughout the network. And so today we have a very firewall-centric view of the world, whether it's firewalls or next generation firewalls or even what's happening with proxies. And the solution for many of the vendors out there today is, well, if you want more security, segment your network, put in another firewall, and we'll be able to protect that segment. All you're doing is you're making the perimeter a little bit smaller. And that's what I would call north-south based protection. But what you really want is multi-directional enforcement. And every single element inside of your infrastructure, whether they're switches or routers, or hypervisors inside of your data center or IP tables, you want to make sure that you're able to enforce policy across each of those various elements. This is what I call multi-directional enforcement. And then finally, you want to make sure that you're actually able to wrap all of these things and manage them. Because if you had to do this with users going and manually configuring things, you're not going to be able to respond to the amount of threats that are coming at you on a day-to-day -day basis. In fact, what we've seen with our Sky ATP service, which is our cloud-based anti-malware service, approximately 1% of all the files that we analyze, millions and millions of files, about 1% of all files downloaded have malware or are malware. Now, the ability to go and manage all of those is critically important, and you need to be able to do that in an automated and intent-driven way. So this is the next level of detail around software-defined secure networks. But let's talk about what we've been doing over the last 15 months to enable this SDSN vision. We started in the strategy two years ago. New products have been coming out now for 15 months. And because there's so many of them, I want to make sure that you understand how they fit into the various areas inside of your infrastructure. So one, let's first start off with the data center and the cloud. I think it goes without saying that we have the world's highest performance firewall at two terabits per second. Over the last 15 months, we had tripled the number of connections per second, and we're very proud of that. But we know that big, fast firewalls are not enough. We also have released what we believe is the industry's only container-based firewall, the Container SRX. We also have shipped the fastest virtual firewall, the virtual SRX. Now, it's important when you're thinking about virtual things, when someone says they have the highest performance, there's two things to think about. One is, how fast does it go? 
And the second thing is how much compute does one use in order to get that performance? And I can tell you that not only are we the fastest, but we do it in half the amount of compute that the next nearest competitor is able to do it in. Now, if we move over to the campus, we have our Sky Advanced Threat Prevention service that we shipped earlier this year. We have a whole new portfolio from our SRX 1500, which shipped in Q1, and then our SRX 4000 series. There's two of those. There's a 20 gig and a 40 gig firewall. And what we're able to see is versus the competitor in this space, Palo Alto Networks, we are twice the capacity and half the size. So we're making not only significant progress, we're leaping past where the competition is from that perspective. And then from a branch perspective, we've transformed, we've actually broken the connection that has happened at the branch since I've been in this industry 23 years, where you have one application tied to one physical appliance. We have now created an environment where you have a platform, both a physical platform as well as a software platform, for delivering services out to the branch, whether those be our services, like the virtual SRX, or our virtual router technology with the VMX, or if you want to go and deploy third-party technology, whether it be web optimization or even third-party routers. We also have the SRX 300, which was launched earlier this year as well, which is the leading price performance player for security for the branch. So you might say, wow, you've been busy. We have been busy. The team has been extremely busy over the past two years building the building blocks to enable this SDSN vision. But that's, quite frankly, not enough. Because it's one thing to have all these security elements, but they actually have to work at the end of the day. And I can tell you that they're great and they work, but we're the ones that build them. So you should make sure you look to third parties. And there is a very trusted third party, known as NSS Labs, who goes and puts every company through the ringer. And just a few months ago, they put out their data center IPS report. And they found that we're significantly better than Palo Alto Networks. And a little bit earlier in the year, we put out, or we, NSS Labs put out the test results for next generation firewalls and found that we're better than both of Cisco's firewalls and significantly better than Palo Alto's firewalls. Because simply having a next gen firewall or an IPS system isn't good enough. It needs to actually stop threats and detect them with the greatest degree of efficacy. And this is something that the team has been able to do. And this is a way from pivoting from not just building fast and high performance devices, but devices that actually stop attacks. So we're very excited about what has been built. Now, not all of you are aware of what Sky ATP is, our advanced threat prevention service. So I want to spend a few moments explaining what we've done. We decided early on that this needed to be a native cloud service, that we needed to use the ability to scale out this service to make sure that we could deal with the scale of files that we expected to be receiving. And we used a set of techniques, both static analysis, machine-based learning, coupled with our patented deception-based technology, to go and truly and then offer a service to any current generation SRX device. Now, the way that this actually works is twofold. One is the SRX devices, whether they're physical or virtual SRXs, they sit in line. They see all the files traversing that firewall. They capture them, and they send them up to the cloud service. The file, if it's already been seen before, a result is sent back immediately, and that file is blocked, and it never hits the endpoint. However, if we had not seen that file before, it needs to run through this entire pipeline, which may take several minutes, and in which case that file has already made its way down to your machine. In that case, we will, earlier this year, actually go and implement policy at that edge firewall so that data cannot be exfiltrated from that device. And that was the case from before up until a few months from right now. Now, a few things you may not know is if you have a current generation SRX or virtual SRX, and you have a valid support contract, which most of you do, 
This is actually what's known as a freemium service. So there is an opportunity for you, if you have one of these devices, to, when you fly back home, become a hero. Understand how much malware is getting onto your network every hour of every day, every single week. Second thing, for those of you who are European in the room and are going to fly across the pond to go back home, when we first launched this service, our data center was in the United States, and we got feedback that not everybody feels comfortable sending their files to a US-based data center. So we put one in Europe. In fact, we did that in the first half of this year. And in just another few short months, we're actually going to expand the capabilities of Sky ATP to include Windows 10 as well as Android OS and detects attacks in those operating systems. But we're also going to make it available via the FedRAMP. For those of you who happen to be part of any portion of the federal government, you're very familiar with FedRAMP, and SkyTP will become available via that service as well. This is a fundamentally transformative offering, and one that we view as the democratization of security. This is one of the key reasons why we made the basic service a free service. But we know that this is simply not enough, and you need to be able to manage all of these elements together. If I go back two years ago, I can tell you that the most vocal piece of feedback that I received from partners and customers was that our network management system was probably the worst in the industry as it relates to security management. I've got a pretty thick skin, but what we went out and we did was we went and hired an entirely new user experience team, and we started from scratch. You know, not a single bolt or line of code was reused in the making of this product, and we have transformed and to what I believe to be the best security management software in the industry. Now, that's one thing for me to tell you about it. What I think is easier and better for the sake of network management is actually to show you how much better it is. And in order to do that, I'd like to go ahead and roll the security director video, please. Introducing Juniper Network's new security director. Innovative, intuitive, intelligent. The new security director provides application visibility to users, reduces risk, and enables moving quickly from knowing to doing. Detect threats as they happen and simply apply remedial actions in real time. Better yet, security director now makes these capabilities intuitive and easy to use. Integration is key to actionable intelligence. The state-of-the-art threat map provides visibility into network-wide events, simplifying detection and identification of threats. Applications are a known vulnerability target. Security Director provides detailed info regarding what's running on your network and who is using it. Security Director automates where you need it most. A simplified firewall policy Auto creates rules. With a new industry breakthrough design, Security Director's look and feel takes you quickly from knowing to doing with a nimble user interface. Security Director, only from Juniper Networks. Meet intelligent, secure networks. Impressive? So the, the team has done a phenomenal job. If you haven't taken the time to go and, and get hands on with it, I highly recommend you do that. I think you'll find it very worth your time. Now, there's a, one additional enhancement that I want to talk about in relation to Security Director, which is our new policy enforcer. This is a policy engine that is an extension to Security Director and is a key tenant to software-defined secure networks. When I talked about Sky ATP and being able to go and block threats at the firewall to prevent data from being exfiltrated, that was merely step one because we knew that we needed to create additional enforcement points inside of your infrastructure. And you want to create those enforcement points as close as to where 
the attack or the infection is as possible. And in our opinion, that is the access layer switch to where users and applications directly connect. And so what Policy Enforcer does is takes the SDSN policy and applies it down to today, the EX switches in your campus or the QFX switches inside of your data center. This is a comprehensive extension to the SDSN story. And I'd like to roll one more video for you to show you what Policy Enforcer is capable of. Let's roll the video, please. As part of Juniper's software-defined secure network strategy, the Security Director Policy Enforcer is a core component. In this demonstration, the Enforcer will create and apply a policy to a Layer 2 switch port to contain an attack on the network. The topology as shown is a secure network, including an SRX series firewall, aggregation and access switches, and Sky Advanced Threat Prevention, aka Sky ATP, that provides external threat feeds. To begin, we will focus on a client connected to a Layer 2 access switch. The client can successfully connect laterally to a web server on the same network, as well as externally to the internet. Now we will walk through the setup steps for the Policy Enforcer using the wizard. We register the Policy Enforcer with Sky ATP. Then we apply a default policy called Infected Host Profile. In this example, this will isolate or block the client from the network. Returning to the client, we will now download an infected file from the internet. Sky ATP will detect and SDSN moves into action. The Policy Enforcer identifies both the IP address and MAC address of each device. At this point, the client is isolated and unable to browse the internet or the web server on the same network. Checking back in on the switch, we see the blocking filter has been added to the access port. Even if the device reconnects to the network on a different switch, which we show here, EX3300-2, the policy enforcer will be able to track its whereabouts and continue to block it. This is the advantage of Juniper's SDSN, securing your network inside and out. All right, so talk about automation, the ability to detect threats, automatically respond to them. Now, in this particular scenario, we were blocking that particular user. You may want to quarantine them into a walled garden VLAN. But if that user picks up their laptop and moves to somewhere else inside the infrastructure and plugs in somewhere else, the policy will move with them. If they get remediated and that malware is removed from their system, then that will be released and they no longer will be blocked or inside that walled garden anymore. These are fundamental enhancements and ones that we believe are enabling everyone to automatically respond to threats that are dynamically happening inside of their infrastructure. Now, I know that I've talked a lot about what SDSN is. We're still been at a relatively high level. But we want to go from there to learning more or even a great depth of knowledge. Our information experience team has done a phenomenal job of building out a very easy to use experience for you to understand more about the different network architectures, whether they be in the data center, campus and branch, and as of today, inside of the software defined secure networks. So I highly recommend you go to the site to learn more about SDSN. You know, SDSN, in our opinion, is the future of security. It solves the fundamental problems that we as an industry are facing. This is the networking industry's electric car moment. So I look forward to talking with all of you throughout the rest of the day and talking more about SDSN. Thank you very much for your time.